Okay, thank you for all attending this morning. Uh, you are at the free webinar, Website Usability, Achieving Effective Communication with Your Customers. This webinar is being brought to you free by Situated Research, which is my company. This is a rebroadcast of Friday's webinar. After today's webinar, what we want you to do is to um, make sure that you email us with any suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, any comments, um, any testimonials that we can put on our website about our webinars. Uh, we usually have everyone enjoy our webinars, so um, they're pretty enjoyable, they're exciting, they're fun, they're informational. Um, so any testimonials would be great. Uh, today's session will be recorded. So Friday we recorded as well. However, today's session will be recorded too, and this recording will be available on our website um, at the end of the day. So please do check it out. If you know anyone who would benefit from this webinar, please tell them about it and direct them to our website, and then they can view the webinar as well. Uh, you're all going to be muted for today's webinar just because there are almost a 1,000 of you. It would be a little chaotic if I didn't. Uh, so I want you to enjoy today's session. Like I said, we do webinars all the time, and they're very enjoyable and fun. Before we start, I always like to do a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Michelle Ann Sherritt, and I have a degree in behavioral psychology. And I also have over 16 years of business experience and marketing experience as well. And that's in several different industries. So that really helps me with my current position being VP and co-founder of Situated Research here in Naperville, Illinois. Um, Naperville is about 45 minutes west of Chicago. And we started Situated Research in October of 08. So some people ask, you know, what is Situated Research? I was redirected to your website when I signed up, but I'm not too sure. Um, just a brief introduction of our company is that we focus on the overall user experience. So whether that's with a website, a video game, a piece of software, a product that you use in your everyday life, um, we go ahead and test it. We do research. We provide that information to companies to help them make a better user experience because the better the user experience, the more likely customers and clients are going to keep buying your product or service and keep coming back to your website. We, of course, do web design and web development as well. So if you do have a current website and you want it redesigned, we could help you with that. Or if you have a complete web team um, that isn't um, educated in usability, um, then we can go ahead and work with your team to help make your website more user-friendly. Uh, we also do consulting on social networks. So we're huge on social media. We have an actual social media course, uh, which I'll talk about later on, um, that you can go ahead and sign up for. It helps you to make your marketing plan for social media. Um, our business, Situate Research, started in October of 08, which is right when the economy tanked. And all the methods that we used were through social media to get business. And I would say 85% of our business still is through social media. So we teach you how to do that in that course. Uh, we also have the free social media webinar series on our website that you can check out as well. Um, and of course, our website URL is www.situatedresearch.com. So the layout for today's session, um, we start a little bit late because we have a lot of people still trickling in, actually. Um, so as that happens, our bandwidth gets a little slow, so that's why I wanted to wait. Um, so we're probably going to go at least six minutes over the hour. Um, we're going to talk about the user behavior. What are your users looking for when they go to a website? We're going to talk about search engine optimization a little bit and menu navigation and navigating through a website. We're going to talk about describing your products and services, how best to do that. We're going to talk about making an overall pleasant experience for your users. And we're also going to talk about the key points for what users really care about. And this is all through research that we've done. It's through research that other usability companies have done. So it's concrete evidence to show you how you can make your website better. The only goal for today's webinar is that I want you to always think about the end user. This is very important because if you don't think about the users coming to your website, why have a website at all? It's just like having a business card of information than on the internet. What's the purpose? What's the point if users are going to come to your site, not have a good experience, and leave right away? 
So we're going to talk about how to make that better. So in order to do that, we have to give you a little bit of background information in psychology because that's how users think. Um, users think through psychology. And so you have to understand cognitive psychology a little bit. You have to understand human-computer interaction or HCI a little bit. So the next three to four slides are going to be um, very informational for you as far as the psychology background goes. So um, you have to understand it a little bit in order to understand your users. So we're going to go through it right now. So the first topic, as I stated, is cognitive psychology. And now cognitive psychology plays a big role in how your users think. That's how we all think. And so cognitive psychology examines the mental processes such as how people think, how they perceive things that they're taking in, how do they remember things? How do they learn? And cognitive psychology, it emerged in the late 1950s because it was a reaction to behaviorism. And behaviorism is the behaviors that are acquired through conditioning. Through, so through what we keep doing over and over and over again and condition ourselves to keep repeating. Now what also comes into play when we think about how do your users think are human factors. Human factors examines the properties of human capabilities and limitations. So what are we capable of? What are our limits? It focuses on physical, cognitive, and social properties. Just as, as an example, ergonomics. We fit items between people and their work. So in your office, ergonomics could be your keyboard, it could be your mouse, it could be your chair your desk, many different items that help you to work better in your environment. Now, human factors emerged during World War II. Prior to World War II, pilots made fatal errors due to complex equipment. Yes, they were tested and they, and they learned how to use this equipment, but in a stressful situation, the interface, what they were presented, was not good. And so it was poor usability, and it became fatal. There are fatal errors that occurred because of that. So prior to World War II, people were really matched with their jobs and machines when it should have been the other way around. Now the next slide talks about human-computer interaction, or HCI. And a lot of you have heard about this. Um, HCI really emerged in the 80s with the introduction of personal computers coming into your home. And so it's really the study of the interaction of humans with computers. How do you interact with your computer? And as we get more mobile and we're walking around with our devices, this is so important. It's really the intersection of several disciplines, computer science, cognitive science, sociology, and human factors, which we just spoke of. So that's a little bit of an introduction into psychology and how your users think just a little bit. We're going to get more into that a little bit later on, but that's just the background with psychology, so we're done with that. We're going to talk now about attention and how well do you and I and your users pay attention. So, <clears throat> attention please. If you haven't been paying attention, please pay attention now. A lot of you are in your offices right now listening to our webinar and you have a lot of distractions going on. Maybe your phone's ringing. Maybe your cell phone's ringing. Maybe your email's popping up. Maybe people are walking through your office door. A lot of you have these outside distractions going on. Attention, the definition, is the cognitive process of focusing on aspects of the environment while ignoring the rest. And that's sometimes referred to as noise. So anything going on around you is noise. And this requires huge mental effort to strictly concentrate on my webinar, okay? And not on your phone and email and whatever's going on around you. Now, there's another item when we pay attention called blindness. And this is, this, this is the way that we sense little from our environment. So we tune out the noise that we just talked about. So how does this pertain to websites? This is an actual screenshot of a heat map that we did with some users. And we had them do a Google search on a certain topic. And so what the heat map does is the dark red areas 
um, are the focused areas. This is where the user spent the most of their time with their eyes looking at. And then the orange or yellow and green, you know, didn't look at it so much. And then the blue didn't look at it hardly at all, just kind of glanced at it. So you can see that when people do searches on the internet, on Google, they're mostly looking at the top four choices that pop up. So this is important for you as a business owner who has a website because you want to make sure that you're those top four. Okay, and we're going to talk about search engine optimization a little later on, um, but you want to make sure. So this kind of hits a couple points, but um, what we're talking about now is blindness. And so you can see on the right, uh, right here in this area, these are all those pay-per-click ads, so those ads that people pay for to have their ad pop up when certain searches happen. The user kind of glanced at them, but didn't focus on them. So we have a whole other webinar on pay-per-clicks and how it works and how it doesn't work and how to make it most effective, but this just shows you that people don't really look at that area. They're focused on those top four choices and ignoring the rest. Then we have something called banner blindness. You ever go to a website and you see ads all over the place? Those most likely are websites that people decide to build on their own using a free tool on the internet, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, the benefits, the pros and cons. Um, but what ends up happening when we do our user testing is that all those ads are ignored. Okay? So as a business owner who built your website with a free tool, you probably have ads all around it. And so you're like, well, that's good because I don't want them to look at all those ads. This is going to push them to look at the content because you can see in the red areas, these are two separate sites on the left and right. And you can see the red areas and they are reading the content and not focusing on the ads. So as a business owner, you're like, this is great. You know, I don't really care. I made my website for free, blah, blah, blah. But this shows that the users did look at the content. However, they all clicked off of that website. They felt it was too distracting. Um, they, they felt different things, which we're going to talk about later on. So, yeah, it could be a benefit, but it's not. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Some factors that affect attention is the complexity of the task. Okay, multitasking is huge. Sometimes you go to a website and just so much is going on. Uh, Forbes is our client right now. We're helping them with their menu navigation. So if you go to Forbes.com, that website's chaotic now. Um, and so we're going to go in and help them to make it less chaotic. But when you go to the home page, there's just so much going on. There's videos playing sometimes. There's content flashing at us. Um, you know, and people who aren't multitaskers are going to leave the site. And most of the time, people do just leave the site because it's just too confusing. And what we found is that they don't even use the menu navigation. They just go strictly to the search box and type in what they're looking for. So because it's Forbes, everybody knows of Forbes, um, they stay on the website to get that information because they know that it's reliable, it's trustworthy. However, they don't use the website the way they should be using it. So that's something to keep in mind as well because it's just chaotic. There's too many menu buttons, too many options, things are getting buried. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. There's also other factors such as when you're reading print on a newspaper in front of your face as opposed to reading print on the computer screen. And we're going to talk about what fonts you should use for your website, etc. in just a minute. And there's selective disregard. People will ignore menus if you're giving them too many options or your menu structure is just chaotic or your labeling is just confusing. And we're going to talk about how to narrow that down further through the webinar today. So humans develop patterns, strategies for limiting cognitive effort. Face it, humans don't like to work. Therefore, we try everything to find shortcuts. We try to apply the same rules to similar situations. So if we use the search box on websites all the time and we go to a website and they don't have a search box, that changes our behavior. So we don't want to use that website. And some of you are thinking, are, is she serious? Like users really behave this way? Yes, they do. 
Um, I could tell you till I'm blue in the face what our research shows, but just think of yourself when you go to a website. What do you do? And that's how we approach every project that we do. How are we going to react? And then we put all of that into practice, and then we have our users come in and test the site as well to prove what we thought as well. Humans apply the same rules, like I said, to similar situations. We're a creature of habit, and we do not try anything new, only familiar. So keep that in mind as you're designing your website or looking at your current website. So now we're going to discuss menu navigation. Okay, so when we're talking about menu navigation, we're talking about the clickable pages on your website. So you have a menu at the top of your website that should be labeled correctly to topics on your website. So your main topic should be your main menu headings. They should also be topics that interest your users. So here at Situate Research, we have an information architect or an IA who um, has a degree in this and helps to take all the content on websites to make a better menu navigation for users that makes sense to them. And we call that also a user journey. So how long does it take a user that comes to your website to order a product or find a piece of information? And that user journey, the longer it gets, the more confusing the website is, the more confused the user is, and the user is going to leave your website. So the best practice is to have between four to six menu options at the top of your page, and that's it. Now, some corporate websites that have a couple hundred pages really can't stick to this rule. So with corporate sites that are huge, we say six to eight at most. If you go to Forbes.com, they have a lot more than that. I forget how many they have, uh, but it's, it's a lot of main menu um, buttons and topics. And so it gets confusing for users, so they just use that search box. So because of that, information is getting buried. Users don't even take the time to find the information. This here is a site map. This is a physical representation of one of our clients' menu navigations that we put together for them. And you'll see that the home page is always number one. And then you go down to the next layer. And so that's your main menu nav. These are the buttons that are at the top of this uh, law firm's page. And so for this one, they have seven main menu navs. Um, but the reason for that is because they have a couple hundred page website. So they needed that extra menu. Um, and then you have the second layer. I'm sorry, the third layer with the submenus under the main menu buttons. And then you have a fourth layer. And so our rule of thumb is that it shouldn't be too deep, too many layers. Otherwise, information is going to get buried. So for that, we say anywhere from three to four layers. That's it. Cut it off. Even with a huge corporate site, cut it off. And you don't want it to be too wide. Otherwise, you're giving them too many menu options and information will get lost. So I have the word inexperience here because a lot of you are thinking about hiring um, a website firm to design a website for you. And if they don't present you with a visual site map, because you're not an information architect, you don't know, you know how to make put one of these together. Um, so they should be presenting this to you. They should be showing you why it makes logical sense with users. And so if they don't, that just shows they're inexperienced. This is an example of a website that we helped with last year, um, but this is what it looked like before we helped them. And so you can see on the top that they have four main menu navs, contact us, bookmarks, order history, build order. Okay, that's okay. Um, on the left, they have all these other menu options. Okay, and this got confusing for users when we tested them. Um, you know, people who weren't familiar with, you know, buying nuts and bolts and blah, 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 um, really got confused and just gave up. People who actually were going to use this website struggled, tried to search for items, but then eventually gave up. So as you can see here, this is very, very confusing for users because there's information all over the place, too many options for them. So let's take today. 
and compare it to 10 years ago. And users' behavior has not changed much. We still have a strong reliance on the back button. We're still confused with multiple browser windows. So if you have a website where you have outside links, um, you know, you want people to click on and give them references to other websites and they open up a new browser window. Um, what ends up happening is they lose track and they can't get back to your website. And what that does is that loses you business, okay? Because they're not going to remember your URL. They're not going to be able to get back. And all that you've done is redirected them to another website that will get their business. So here's Situa Research. When we build websites or help with the usability, we develop gray pop-out boxes. So you can go to our website, um, go to our publications page, and hit the abstracts, view abstract, and you'll see an example of what a gray pop-out page is. And what it is basically is it grays out the background, so the page that you're on, and it pops out a small box with the content that you wanted them to see. So if it's another website, it'll pop out. And they can view the whole website through this little window. And when they're done, they just hit close, and they're back on the page that they were on, on your website. This keeps people from leaving. A big thing that we see today when we review websites is blogs. Everyone wants one. It gains you traffic, credibility, trustworthiness. It's awesome. However, if it's not integrated into your website, it's useless. Because if you just have a link to your blog or an RSS feed and they click on it, and they go to a different site for that, they're most likely never going to get back to your website. They're never going to order anything. They're never going to ask you for information. They're not going to do anything. They're just going to view your blog. So if you want to know what an integrated blog is, go to our website. Our website's blog um, actually is a WordPress blog. And we simply manipulated the code and embedded it into our website so that when you click on it, it looks and feels just like our website. You're not leaving our website at all. However, people don't know it's a WordPress blog. So we do that as well um, with clients because it really does help them and it helps to get unique, good traffic to their website, which is what you want. So users, you know, compared to 10 years ago, like I said, their user behavior doesn't change much, and they still ignore ads. So any pop-up ads, anything that you have going on on your website that's popping at them, they ignore. They're looking for elements that appear clickable all the time, and they spend little time on each website. They go there, they know what information they want, and if it's not readily available to them, guess what, folks? They leave. So let's talk about visual perception. Um, we mentioned it a little bit earlier as far as font sizes go, so let's go ahead and talk about those guidelines. Here we're talking about visual acuity. And so biologically, we accommodate for our eyes. We accommodate for sensitivity as far as color psychology goes with websites. So when we evaluate websites and they have a black background with white text or a dark red background with white text, that hurts the user's eyes. Especially for me, I have really good vision. And when I have to evaluate these websites with these backgrounds, oh my gosh, I get a headache right after it. Um, most of our users do too. It's just really hard on the eyes. And some people say, well, I do that because I want my content to pop. I want everything to pop on my website, so I do this dark background. And it's horrible. It's so 1990s, it needs to be fixed because you have to think about the sensitivity of your users. You also have to think about the age of your users. You know, what's the demographic of these users that are coming to your website? Is it a younger generation? Is it an older generation? Is it a mix? So you have to think about that as well. You also have to think about the size of your font, the contrast of the colors, any motion. Oh my gosh, flash animation is very 1990s as well. Flash animation is really bad for users because what it does is it distracts them from the content of your website. When I evaluate websites or when our team does, and there's flash animation banners at the top or slideshows going on, we're focused, trying to focus, trying to pay attention to the content and read that content so that we can evaluate it for the client.
But that flash animation at the top just keeps distracting us. It doesn't stop moving. And so, you know, our users who are testing sites just give up. Or what they end up doing is they scroll their browser window up to the top of their screen so they don't have to see the flash animation as they look at the content or menu navigation. Um, so keep that in mind as well. The other thing to keep in mind too is with flash animation, if it's not programmed correctly, on mobile devices like cell phones and iPads, that flash animation will not show up. It will be a blank space. Now we have the 10 point rule for font. And <clears throat> for the general audience, you want between 10 to 12 point font. This is standard for websites. If your user demographic is senior citizens and people with visual impairments, you want it to be a little bit larger, so 12 to 14. If it's young children or beginner readers, same rule applies, 12 to 14 font. If it's teenagers and young adults, 10 to 12. Now, the Mayo Clinic, everyone's heard of the Mayo Clinic. They do a great job on their website because they have a demographic of all types of people coming to their website, all ages. So to accommodate for this, they've added a text size button. So you can decrease the font size or you can increase it. And this is great usability. The typography is very important. Uppercase letters, which I've seen on some websites, it slows the reading of your users. Uppercase removes word patterns. So a tip is to write your headings and titles in sentence case or title case only. Be consistent. Be consistent on your site. Use the same with in-site navigation conventions. Implement web standards. Have a search box at the top of your page if you have more than 100 pages on your website. OK and cancel buttons, position them consistent with your operating system. These are all things that people have conditioned themselves to. So they want to see it on websites as well. So now let's discuss language, your content of your website. A lot of companies have what they call content writers now. And, and we have two as well on staff if, if clients want us to write the content for their website or if they want to write it and then we just look it over um, to make it more SEO friendly. And <clears throat> what we find is that the content that clients write is not consistent and it doesn't hold a good word order. So what does this mean? Read the first sentence. Drop the molten silver, fill the night sky. This took 4.2 seconds to read. We actually had users test read this, and we, and we um, went ahead and measured how long it took them to read it. So that takes 4.2 seconds. Now the next sentence, read aloud. The night sky was filled with drops of molten silver. And that was way faster. That was 3.5 seconds to read. And it was just the word order. Now let's talk about skimmers versus readers. Skimmers are who is on the internet today. Skimmers go to websites and just skim for information that they need. So that information has to be readily available to them. They spend less time on each word and comprehend less. So if you have a website that runs vertical, like your pages run vertically with paragraphs after paragraphs of information, your users aren't reading it. Users read the first sentence of the paragraph, see this whole page of content, and go to the next page. So it's a wasted effort, especially if you hired a content writer. What a waste of money. So the right amount of content on pages is very important. So an information architect as well as a content writer would be able to assess that for your website. This is a great example. Um, this is a website selling diapers. And so again, we use that heat map where the users, um, you know, where are their eyes fixated? And so here you can see that there's um, a title here and there's also two paragraphs of content and then there are some photos. And so these green areas, they glanced at, they looked at the company logo, they looked at the diapers real fast, but they were fixated on the baby's face. 
So imagery really helped out here. Static imagery, not flash animation. I always get that question during this um, webinar is, okay, well, you said flash animation was bad. It is. Um, it distracts users, as well as photos distract users, as you can see here. So they were fixating on the baby's face, and then what ended up happening is they went to the next page. So they didn't even read this content that was here. Okay, and this was the home page of this company's website. So we had to restructure it a little bit for them. Now let's discuss problem solving and decision making. Like I said, when users go to a website, they have to problem solve sometimes. If they really want to find information on your website and they're dedicated to it, they'll stay on the website till they find it. But 85% of users don't do that. They leave. So you have distractions like ads. They know that you built your website yourself. They don't trust your company. You probably have stock imagery that you're using and not real imagery that you took, which makes distrust between your users and your company and your website. If you have videos that are all over your website, not a good thing. People don't view those videos. Some clients say, I want a video on my homepage just introducing my company. You can do that, but I'm just letting you know that research shows that users will not view those videos. So you waste all this money and they don't even view it. And avatars, live avatars, have you ever gone to a website where a little lady or a man pops up and starts talking to you? As soon as you get to the website, 90% of the time, users just start clicking anywhere on the screen to try to shut that thing up. It's so annoying because it just pops up and it's like, I didn't come to the website to be talked to. I didn't come to the website to be annoyed. And we understand why clients do it. They want to get information out to their users right away. But users don't want that. And they get mad and they leave that website within 50 seconds. They just leave. They're irritated because they can't shut that thing up. There's no X, there's no close button. They just can't figure it out. In some websites, you can't close the avatar. The avatar has to finish what it was saying and then it'll go away. And, it's, and that's at least, you know, 30 seconds of this thing yapping at you when you just came to the website to find out an email address or a certain piece of information or just to order a product. You want to reduce the interaction cost, minif minimize interferences, streamline the interaction, minimize the amount of reading. So don't have your website full of content. Minimize the attention switches, so anything switching their attention from why they came to the website. And make information readily available. And the only way that you know what your users are coming to your website for is to do testing. So what it boils down to, what customers are looking for, is clean and concise advertising. Not cluttered with words or photos that aren't needed. No stock imagery. Some people like to purchase stock imagery, use clip art. It's so tacky. Users really hate that. They know when you're using stock imagery. If you have a conference table with people smiling and it doesn't look natural, that's stock imagery. Use a real photo. Take a real photo of your conference room. If you have clients, um, you know, that you want to take pictures of and put on your website, do that. Just don't use stock imagery. Because what that does is it gets the confidence level of your users down. It doesn't build trust. They think that everything on your website then is fake and they leave. You have to make sure also customers are looking for information that they would want to know on your website. So make sure that it's readily available. And forms are huge. If you have a form for lead capturing on your website, that's great. But make sure you're not asking weird questions like, what's your address? You don't need to know that. Um, what's your company size? You don't need to know that yet. They haven't even talked to you yet. Name, email, and maybe a phone number. And that's all you need. If you're asking for more than that, users don't build trust with you. And they feel, OK, I'm going to get a telemarketer call. Or I'm going to get something in the mail. They're asking for my mailing address. They don't feel comfortable doing that yet. 
So don't ask for it. If you ask for a bunch of, of information and put the little red stars next to it and say it's required, they're not going to fill it out. Now let's talk about social psychology and the social web. My greatest topic that I love talking about is social media. Um, I actually have a book coming out towards the beginning of next year on social media. Um, like I said, our company started in October of 08, and that was right when the economy tanked. And 85% of our business still comes through social media. But what we do in that book, as well as the social media class I was talking to you about and the free webinars, is we show you what worked for us and how it worked for our other clients. And so it really does help you out. So social media is my big topic. Um, but social media proof for users on your website, great thing is testimonials. And when you put testimonials on your website, include first and last name of where the testimonial came from and the company name. That will gain your user's trust. If you just put a first name, you could have just made up that testimonial. Reviews are great. If you have a product and you have reviews on your product, that really helps to gain trust with your users. Endorsements from experts within your industry are huge as well. And the popularity, the number of comments you have on your blog, the number of downloads, the number of members, if you have a Facebook fan page, all build credibility. So I keep talking about the social media marketing class that we have. Just go to our website. Um, it's a five-day course, and it's 10 hours of video. But it's all on demand. So when you sign up, you get a login and password. It's good for one month. And you can view these videos at any time during that month. And I'm also available for the next three months with any questions that you have. So you can email me, call me, do whatever you need to do to get your questions answered. Um, and that's $99, which is a really good uh, rate for this course. Um, we help you to plan out your social media marketing campaign step by step using Facebook, Twitter, blogs, LinkedIn, and more. And basically what we do is we give you the tools and show you how to get your ROI out of social media. And if you're not into social media and you think, oh, it's just a fad, um, you definitely want to check out our free social media webinar series. Um, because it's not. You're losing out on millions and millions of customers that you could have through social media. Um, so definitely check that out. So social media has social modeling. We do what we see others do. So if we see our friend really likes this company, we want to check it out and see why they like this company. If we see that our friend um, is doing something, we want to do it as well. You want to receive feedback, and you want to have a wide audience. <clears throat> so in summary, emotions and design. Emotion equals driven behavior. Emotions will drive behavior to do something, to have your users do something. So you have to create emotion on your website. Attractive things work better. That's just a plain fact. So some websites, like the Apple website, Apple is awesome. Apple's website just has lively colors, it's laid out nicely, it makes sense to the user. I have a pleasant experience when I use their website. I never get lost. It was done really, really well. And I have a good experience. So guess what? I buy I buy Apple products. I have a PC that I'm that I love. I love PCs, but Apple products are great. So I really believe in the company, I trust the company, and I love their website. Mercedes-Benz, this is a great example of another great website that conforms to all the usability standards in the industry. It's well laid out, that picture is beautiful. It's not stock imagery, it, it really is a good user experience, a good feel to the website. Tide. This little girl is so darn cute. I want to buy Tide to make my clothes bright and vibrant for my children. So this is a great website, not only because of that, it draws me in emotionally, but just the colors pop. The aesthetics are great. The overall layout of the website is laid out very nicely. That makes sense to me, the user. The menu navigation makes sense. 
it has a search box. It's great. Now here's the website. Okay, so what do you think I think of this? Or our users think of this? This is the California government website for registered nurses to give them information. It's too much content. Now some websites have to have a lot of content. This would be one of them. But there's a better way to lay out this information that makes more sense to users, makes information easy to find, and is just laid out aesthetically nicer. So let's talk real briefly about SEO or search engine optimization. We have a whole free webinar that we did on advanced search engine optimization. So just go to our recordings page and you can review that. But just real briefly, different search engines have different algorithms or mathematical equations that will rank your website and will put it on page one of Google or page one of any search ranking. Um, so Google we're going to talk about here. Google's algorithm determines your page ranking. And then this changes monthly, sometimes weekly. And no one really knows what the algorithm is. But what we can do and what we know is that it's all based on the popularity of your website. So how many unique users, users that actually convert to leads, come to your website? How much traffic do, do you get to your website? How do you get that traffic to your website? So blog integration is huge, which we talked about earlier. Social networking is huge. So check out our whole free social networking series to learn more on the specifics of how to use these sources. Now search engine optimization, a lot of companies specialize in it. Um, and you pay a lot of money for it. And you think that you're going to be on page one. And they say that they guarantee it, but in their contract the word guarantee is nowhere in there because they can't guarantee it. They don't know the algorithm. So it doesn't happen. You won't get on page one instantly. It takes at least six months to a year to do that because you have to gain that traffic. You have to gain that trustworthiness with your users. So, you know, make sure that if you go with an SEO company that's free. So make sure, like a web design firm that does SEO as well, make sure that the SEO is free. That it's included with your website package. Or make sure that it's at least under $1,000 because SEO efforts are really up to you and doing your social media and getting that unique traffic to your website. So unless the SEO company does social media marketing, don't trust them. And if you're not sure, email me and I'll help you out to make a decision. So what do companies do? Um, there's different things that you can do within the code of a website. Um, there's keywords that you use on each page of your website that we talk about in that advanced SEO free webinar. So just check that out. There's many tricks that we can do to get you on page one, but again, it takes six months to a year to do so. So earlier we talked about those of you who decide to make a website on your own or those of you who are thinking about it. And just know that with that, there is no usability. So making a website on your own, let's talk about that. Um, it's a huge time investment and a huge learning curve. Usability expertise is totally missing. Graphic design is missing because they have templates that you simply choose from. It has elementary programming, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's just an expensive lesson. A real quick example is a florist, local florist in our area. Um, spent about eight months to make a website on their own spent time away from their family every evening after running their business. Um, took a huge learning curve for them um, because they didn't know how to develop a website. They thought that this free tool would be easy to use and it wasn't. And so it was just a huge time investment, huge learning curve. Um, they finally got the website up and running and then they found out that they weren't getting any traffic. So they hired an SEO company. And the SEO company, they paid thousands to this company and it worked. They got users to their website, but what happened is the users came to their website, and because the website wasn't structured correctly, there was no usability at all, um, and they could tell that the website was made by the owner, um, which didn't gain them trust, and it didn't gain the 
uh, company any kind of credibility at all, um, they decide to leave the website or they use the website in Safari versus Firefox, the different search engines, and the shopping cart didn't work properly, so they left the website. So it was a huge expensive lesson because that client actually ended up coming to our company and we built them a website and then they had to pay us as well. Um, we gave them a huge discount just because of the poor experience that they had and, you know, they were a business owner. They didn't really know. Um, you know, it sounded like a good idea and they found out that it wasn't. So we gave them a big discount because of that. Um, and now their website's awesome. It works in all the search engines. It's great. Um, they're getting a lot of business from it. But the first step they took was to do it on their own. A lot of people also sometimes have a friend who knows a little bit of programming to build a website for them, and they don't have that usability background. They don't have the information architect background to make a good menu nav that makes sense to users. They're not a graphic designer. They're not all of these things. They're a programmer. So you have to keep all of that in mind. Now, I said that these websites have poor programming or elementary programming. And so with that, that means, like I said, that florist website didn't function correctly in Safari, but it would function correctly in Firefox. It had a lot of programming errors within it. Um, and so the shopping cart wasn't working, so they lost a lot of business because of that. They had menu, um, main menu nav overlapping photos in some of the search engines. Um, they had text overlapping things. The website just wasn't consistent. And that information architecture with the main menu nav was just all messed up because the, the client, the business owner, just did whatever they thought was right. So, some free tools. If you have a current website, go to validator.w3.org. This website's going to check the code of your website. So, you have to put the URL of each page of your site to check every page. Um, cut and paste it into the search box and then hit go. And it's going to show you the number of programming errors that you have on every page of your website. So that's a good thing to know because you should want your website to be perfect. You should strive for perfection. And if you do that, the word green, or I'm sorry, the word past will be in green. So test out our website, Situated Research. Check every page of our website and you'll see that we have no programming errors at all. And that's great because we strive for perfection. We want it to be perfect. Our programmers know what they're doing. So they eliminate all those programming errors. And our website works and functions in any web browser. We don't have a problem. So check out your website. And if you do have errors, go to the person who made your website and say, hey, why do I have these errors? Fix them. Also go to WebsiteGrader.com. And it should be WebsiteGraderOneWord.com. There's no dot in between. This website is through HubSpot, and it grades your website out of a score of 100. It goes through your content, your social media outlets, your blog, and it looks at your traffic, your keywords, your links, everything. And it evaluates your website and compares it to other websites within your industry. So check that out as well. So I love this picture of this lady sitting in front of her computer. And how many times have you sat in front of your computer and gone to a website and you feel like the website's kicking your butt. You can't find what you were looking for. And she says, I thought you were supposed to be user friendly and the computer screen's punching her out saying get lost. That's what your website's doing if it's not user friendly. If information's not readily available, if there are forms that aren't easy to fill out, if the content isn't relevant, you are just keep repeating yourself or there's a call to action all the time, um, you just want someone to buy your product, not good. So if you're wondering about your website, again, do validator.w3.org, do websitegrader.com, but also sign up for our free website evaluation. Um, go to our website and go under the website uh, services page and sign up. It's free. And what we do is we go over 20 different areas of usability. And these are just some of the company logos, companies that we've helped and done a report for. And most of the time, websites have some things that need to be fixed. Um, other times, the website needs to be completely overhauled. And there's the occasion where we do get websites that are 100% perfect. And we look at everything. We look at content, menu navigation, graphics, 
the aesthetics of the website, the layout of the website, where things are positioned, and we actually have users who test the site. And so we've done over 1,100 of these reports, and so we have tons of users in our database, and we have tons of users who have the time who go through your website and answer some questions, um, so you get an actual perspective of users. So check that out. So let's talk about trust. What are some credibility factors? You may never have thought that your users come to your website and gain trust with your company and then decide to order something or sign up for something. So your website really is a reflection of you and your company. So there's direct and, and indirect experiences. Having served that user well in the past, has the website helped them before? Was it good and speedy customer service for those users who have had a problem or question? Being a well-known and respected brand, one of the long-lasting or being a subsidiary of a respected company or at least affiliated with one. The appearance, the visual design in the website, is it clean, professional, does it look good? Is it slick? You don't want the website to be slick. There's a difference. Um, this will give the impression of being a high-cost provider. So like Apple's website looks really slick. It looks really good, okay? <clears throat> but we know that Apple products are a little bit expensive. There's, they're a high-cost provider. So keep that in mind when you do the visual design of your website. Mm. Other factors that contribute to credibility is content. Is it truthful content? If a user catches a site in a lie, they'll assume that other claims on your website are false as well. With content, you want to make sure that specific information and facts are there. Include prices. Because if you don't include pricing on your website, they think that you're keeping something from them. Be trustworthy. Be upfront. Update your content. Make sure it's recent content. Make sure that you have comprehensive information. If something the user knows about or expects to find on your website is missing, they wonder what else is missing. And the traceable physical world to the outside. Tie the physical world like an address, a phone number to your website that builds credibility. The customer service contact information form. Make sure it's easily found on the website. Make sure that they can contact you. Now, the business model is huge, too. Don't do bait and switch. That lowers your credibility. Um, my husband and I were looking at cars to purchase, and we found this one dealership that had a certain price on the car. And so we got really excited. We scheduled an appointment. We drove very far to go look at this car. And then they said, oh, well, the price is actually this. And we said, no, we were on your website. And we even brought it up, and we said, you know, this is the price. And they said, no, that's not the price. That was a mistake. This is the price. I'm sorry. Um, and they wouldn't do anything about it. And they said, we're going to fix that on our website. You know, we were really upset. Um, it's been about a month now. And if you go to the website, that price is still on that car. That's bait and switch. You don't want to do that. That loses that company credibility. Adding things to shopping carts that users didn't, didn't ask for is not good. Sometimes you go to a shopping cart and you purchase an item or put it in your cart and the company will add another item and say, oh, we recommend this item as well and just add it to your shopping cart. Not good. Aggressive lead generation tactics are not good. Asking for personal information too soon before users are ready to make a commitment doesn't gain trust. And make sure that you have a competent website, good usability, easy to navigate, meaningful search results. And smaller issues like endorsements, good free information, lack of hype or hard sell, good customer reviews and examples of previous work for others to see on your website is always good. So how do you move your company in the right direction? Use user-centered design. User-centered design focuses on the user's needs, tasks, and goals. So at the beginning of the webinar, I said your main goal for today is to always think of your user. Do that when you're developing your website. Spend time on initial research and requirements. Identify your target audience and observe them. Make sure you're there. it's always in your head. Make sure that if you do use, do uh, usability research, 
that the users that you use are in their natural environment, so they don't act differently when going to your website. Make sure that they're able to accomplish their tasks. Let users define the product requirements. What are their needs? What do they want to accomplish? How does their environment affect their behavior? Emphasize on iterative design process. This means based on iterations of the project throughout testing. So you're going to keep reevaluating your website as you go through testing. You're going to keep making tweaks so that you can make that better user experience. And evaluate the system on real target users. Actually do usability research and testing with actual users. Don't use your staff. Don't use your staff's family. Use actual users who would come to your site. So here at Situate Research, we do usability research and testing, and it's all based off of Dr. Sherrick's background. He always keeps the end user in mind. And these different bullet points here are all specialties that we have. And that's what makes our web design company unique. We're the only ones in the world that have a PhD on staff that has the focus on these different areas, that has a PhD in these different areas. So he's specialized. And so we take all of these components and apply it to our customers' websites. Whether we work with your webmaster, your friend who built your site, your whole web team, um, or if we design a whole website for you um, by ourselves. We always have all of these items in practice on your website. And so Dr. Sherritt is the one who conducts all the testing before the site's released to our clients. Now the time span for this, a basic website, um, is about two to four weeks to complete, and a more complex one is two to four months. Now where do you want to spend your money? You want to spend it on usability research. I mean, this whole webinar has taught you the benefits. You want to make sure you pick a good firm to work on your website. If you already have a website, definitely get the usability research done. Here at Situa Research, we have a whole packet that starts at 4500 where we actually just do a report where we go through usability on your website. The benefits is that you get actual testers to use your site before you launch and then find out that everything's wrong with the site. You, it's actually cheaper to do this than going back after it launches to make corrections. And different people tend to identify different problems. We take a heuristic approach. We evaluate on several criteria that we talked about earlier. Because we are not part of your project, we come in with an unbiased approach. There's no inside politics involved. So if you have a team inside your company, they want to make sure that your website is working, but they're already self-involved. They're involved. It's their company. It's their website. So we come in unbiased. We want to make sure that your website is good and that you get return on investment and that it's user-friendly and all that great stuff, but we're unbiased. Um, the reviews are based on our extensive experience. We've tested over 1,100 websites and intranets with more than 3,000 users, not just in the U.S., but all over. And we know what works and we know what doesn't work. So who should invest? Companies are interested in having their website or intranet or application subjected to independent expert review. That should, that, those are the people who should be getting this. This is useful if you are looking for a new strategy or a direction for your overall user experience. And if you are not, it is still a good idea to get this assessment on your website from time to time. We can test existing designs. We can test um, prototypes that you have for your website. If you just have um, a design, you know, that you drew out on a piece of paper, um, you know, we can go ahead and go through that with you. Um, if you have a website that's, that's ready to release, we can do that as well. Um, or if you want to start from scratch, we can do that too. So again, the deliverables are that you get a written report. We describe the problems and issues with your current website. We complement that with a conference call or go-to meeting. We go through um, questions that you have. We go through additional advice on the design. And the report ends up being very long. Um, and just to note, the longer the report doesn't mean that the value is better. Um, we find many errors um, on websites. And so we incorporate those all into the report. And we give suggestions for improving those errors. So the report addresses two levels of issues. Um, the specific usability problems in the design, 
Uh, we recommend changes that will improve the usability, and we typically find between 50 to 100 design elements that need to be revised and looked at again. We do high-level analysis, so we look at the direction of the usability, we look at the direction of the design, and we recommend a strategy for achieving significant advances in the user experience. So um, you can request a sample report if you'd like to see that. Go ahead and email me, and again, the pricing for this starts at $4,500, just depending on the size of your website. So the bottom line from today's session is that you have a website that's tested by professionals so that you can provide a better user experience for your users. It'll save you money in the long run. And you want to go with a company that cares about your user's experience. Users will know if you put the time into your company website or if you didn't. So now we're going to go ahead and do Q&A. Um, and I don't see any questions yet, so remember in that upper right-hand corner um, in the questions box, type your questions. And while you're doing that, I'll go through the final slides of the presentation. Um, again, this webinar will be made available at the end of today, so you can view it. If you um, have iTunes, you can go ahead and download it for free. So just go to our webinars page and do that. And then lastly, this is my contact information. So again, our company is Situate Research, and there's my personal email address with our company phone number, our blog, our LinkedIn, Twitter accounts, um, web address. Remember to subscribe to the podcast, and also join us on our monthly newsletter list. Um, we always have new webinars, webinar schedules coming up, new topics, white papers that we write on certain topics. So sign up for that monthly newsletter and you'll always get that information. So I'm, I'm looking and I still don't see any questions, which sometimes happens. That just means I answered all of them. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, just feel free to email me and I'll be more than happy to help you out with that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and leave this contact page up for just a minute. Um, so go ahead and write down the information so that you have it. Contact me if you have any questions or any comments or testimonials for today's webinar. I always want to see those. And I want to thank you for joining me this morning for our webinar, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day.